Now, how is mitochondrial dysfunction treated and what changes are possible with treatment? So this is another place where the distinction between disease and dysfunction is important. And many forms of mitochondrial disease cause quite severe disability. I'll show you a video in a moment showing you the extreme degree that mitochondrial disease can impair the ability of an organism to survive. For such severe disease, effective treatments haven't yet been discovered. But for more mild disorders, um, there are treatments that are possible. And um, mild, those who are mildly affected tend to respond better to treatments as well. This was a patient that I took care of during my residency. And it shows you this infant, this newborn, had a very, very extreme form of mitochondrial disease that um, basically impaired his ability to breathe, which is why he's intubated. And you'll see here just a sample of what severe mitochondrial disease can do. Now this infant was not sedated at all. And he couldn't move, he couldn't breathe on his own, and survived just a few days, and care was withdrawn. So when we talk about the body requiring energy, this is what happens when the body isn't able to make energy. Now, um, when mitochondria are so severely impaired, any degree of supplementation and vitamins really can't help because the mitochondria's capability of functioning has been so dramatically um, in, uh, impaired. Now, fortunately, mitochondria are often impaired to a much milder degree where they still have the capability to function better. And what can we do to help that process? So some leading university medical centers have had very good success in the treatment of mitochondrial disease and dysfunction. And the Kennedy Krieger Institute at Johns Hopkins is one of these. They are a leading center for the treatment of autism and mitochondrial disease and dysfunction. And for over 15 years, they've been using vitamins and supplements to treat patients who come from all over the country because what they offer is a very specialized type of care. Dr. Richard Kelly, who's the director of the Division of Metabolism at Johns Hopkins, wrote this practice guideline to help other physicians do what they do at Johns Hopkins. I have copies here and you can access them online too if you're interested in reading more. Now, this is the treatment that they've developed. It's a combination of vitamins and supplements and this sort of treatment regimen is sometimes referred to as a cocktail because it involves many different ingredients. L-carnitine, coenzyme Q10, and vitamin B5 work to improve the function of the mitochondrial respiratory chain, which you saw earlier in the video by MitoAction. It's the portion of the mitochondria that generates ATP, which is the body's fuel. Vitamin C, vitamin E, and also CoQ10 function as antioxidants. And antioxidants are molecules that help to protect cells and mitochondria from damage that can occur through a process called oxidation. All of these ingredients are dosed by weight, so the child's size dictates um, the dosage. Now, many different vitamins and supplements have the potential to help mitochondrial function. And the ones that are used most consistently are L-carnitine, CoQ10, vitamins C and E, a range of B vitamins, L-creatine, alpha-lipoic acid, and L-arginine. And these different treatments are described in a really superb article um, called A Modern Approach to the Treatment of Mitochondrial Disease. And even though these therapies are generally safe and there's agreement that they have real potential to be beneficial, there's a big obstacle to therapy, which is that it's very hard to get a child to take so many different supplements in large amounts. The two main options currently are to go through a compounding pharmacy or to buy the individual ingredients over the counter. And there are challenges to both of these. So. Going through a compounding pharmacy, for example, has some challenges in terms of safety, stability, and also tolerability. Going through a very well-trusted, well-established quality pharmacy can help with the issue of safety. But the difficulties in terms of stability and tolerability are still there. So compounding pharmacies as a whole aren't regulated in the way that pharmaceutical manufacturers are. So there's no verification of the dose or the source of the ingredients, and there have been some recent very high-profile cases of contamination of products that have been created at compounding pharmacies. 
the compounded form of the cocktail is not shelf stable, it requires refrigeration, it often has a poor taste and appearance, and there are limited options to what they're able to do. Um, there may be multiple liquids or multiple liquids as well as oils that a child has to take. The problem with traditional over-the-counter supplements in individual forms is that the quality of the manufacture and ingredients is often unknown. It's hard to dose them in the right ratios that a particular child may need. The stability is often not tested. There can be a high pill burden. And because you want to dose by weight, it can be difficult to find the individual components and put them together um, in the right dosages for a particular child. There are some over-the-counter mitochondrial cocktail formulations that are high quality. And in the dietary supplement world, the standards that have been set by the FDA are called certified good manufacturing practices. And companies that take the extra step of having them verified by a third party are considered to be the highest quality. So I've listed a few here. I haven't shown their specific names, but I can tell you more about them if you'd like to know more. These are the forms that they come in, the contents that they have and some other features that are important. Now you can see how different they are in what they contain. And this is where it's helpful to talk with a physician so that you know what your child may need. You can also see that if you take a certain formulation, you're stuck with what it contains and also what ratio it contains, as well as what allergens may be in it or artificial sweeteners or preservatives. So those are all factors that I think are very important to take into account. In addition to taking mitochondrial supplements, there are also other steps, and they involve optimizing diet and lifestyle. For example, increasing the frequency of meals and avoiding long periods of fasting and staying well hydrated. Avoiding medications like valproic acid, certain cholesterol-lowering agents, and certain antibiotics, which can be toxic to mitochondria, is also important. And avoiding, if possible, certain physiologic stressors like illness, dehydration, fever, exposure to extremes of temperature, surgery, anesthesia, and prolonged fasting or starvation. Obviously, sometimes those are conditions are unavoidable, and so what you want to do is provide the right supportive care during those times. And that means supportive care in terms of hydration, nutrition, and certain supplements that can be helpful. And finally, consistent moderate exercise is also useful. And you know, you hear this a lot that exercise is important, but it should really be thought of as a therapy because it really has beneficial effects for mitochondrial function.